it's uh, it's a great study. Even I was I was praying because the example of his life, because of his uh, prophetic ministry uh, as well. Uh, it is so outstanding in terms of its um, its history and the details pre-written in advance that its authorship is constantly under attack by uh, by the liberals uh, because. Uh, again, Daniel is able to talk about, again, the uh, Babylonian kingdom and uh, the reign under Nebuchadnezzar through the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. Uh, and, then, and then he predicts exactly how the Medo-Persian Empire will, will take over this seemingly, you know, unstoppable, unmovable empire. Probably maybe the greatest empire on the face of, of the earth historically. Uh, but Daniel predicts that. And then... Uh, goes on and talks about the next world power uh, under Alexander. Describes him, his battles, how he would take over, directions he would come from. I mean, incredible detail. And then talk about the fact, but he would not have an heir. And so his kingdom would be split among four generals, which it was. And then he talks in details about the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, the two generals that would war against each other over Israel uh, in, in particular. Nobody doubts the, the incredible accuracy of the historicity of Daniel. What people get bent out of shape about is the fact that he's a writer in the 6th century b before any of these events ever, ever, ever come down. So you got one of two choices. You either have to dispute the authorship or you have to believe that, that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Those are your only two options. You can see why some people <laughs> would <laughs> choose to dispute the authorship. But uh, what's incredible about it is the, uh, the details that are in here that lend itself to the accuracy that only Daniel could have written it. In fact, as we get going here, I'll show you a slide of the, what's known as the uh, Babylonian Chronicles. Little clay tablets written uh, that are now in the British Museum that really tell us incredible details about the history of Babylon. And guess what? Every detail matches exactly what Daniel tells us in his text as, as well. Liberals don't like that. But there, there it is in the British uh, Museum. The other thing that's interesting about it is the fact that uh, the book is written in, uh, in a couple of different languages. It's written uh, in uh, Aramaic, which is a derivative of, of Hebrew. It was a common language. It was the court language of, of Babylon of that day. It's the language, of course, that the people in captivity, the Jews, ended up speaking. It was the language that uh, Jesus and his disciples knew well and spoke uh, in his day in the first century. What's different, though, is that as Daniel writing in the 6th century, Aramaic at that time had a different syntax or sentence structure. That's the way Daniel writes. In the 1st century, same language, but order of subject and verbs, adverbs had changed by then. Uh, and just by the language itself, whoever wrote this had to have written in the 6th in the century. To know the kind of details that they knew um, and that Daniel lays out in terms of uh, the kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, how it ran and so forth. Uh, it's, uh, so it's incredible in terms of the authorship and the accuracy uh, of, of Daniel being the author itself. If that's not enough for you, Jesus himself said Daniel is the author. So that uh, kind of uh, top things off right, right there. So if uh, Daniel's not the author, then Jesus is a liar. So you got, you got a couple other options there too. But uh, it makes it because of all of that, because of this incredible prophecy that he wrote about historically that has been fulfilled. And of course, then Daniel later, chapters about eight on, begins to write about uh, Israel in particular and what will happen uh, in the future uh, in such great details. Again, it's been said uh, uh, appropriately that if you don't understand the book of Daniel, you will not understand the book of Revelation. They go, they go hand in hand. In fact, when I studied them in Bible college, you take them both simultaneously because they fit together like, uh, like a glove. And... Um, and of course, Daniel claims to be the author over and over again. In chapter 1 of verse 7, uh, he says, In the first year of Belteshar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind. And he was laying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. 
uh, later in verse 15, I, Daniel, was troubled in my spirit, and the visions passed through my mind, disturbed me. Later in verse 28, this is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself, and it goes on and on and on. Daniel claims to be the author, writing in first person uh, all the way through uh, the book. In terms of the, uh, the purpose of the book, there are several, but a couple that are important to us. Uh, one is, we'll see this morning, chapter 1, Daniel's personal dedication to God. And uh, this is such a, uh, an important study. Uh, how, does, how does a young guy like Daniel, you know, make it uh, through this captivity period? Can you imagine the phone call, Daniel's mom calling him. He's off in another, you might have this phone call with your kids as they go off to college. Daniel, how's it going there? Great, Mom, great. Yeah, it's a little different here. No, no, uh, no Shabbat school. No, yeah, tough to get your hands on a copy of the scriptures. I've memorized quite a bit, and we got the prophet Ezekiel over here, so that's kind of helping out. How about the company you're keeping? Very different, Mom. Magicians, sorcerers, you know, they're into the occult, cast spells on people, that kind of thing. Real big on reading the stars and predicting the future. That's who I'm hanging with, Mom. Well, how are you doing, Daniel? Well, look, Mom, it's okay because I've resolved in my heart not to defile myself. Good, that's all I needed to hear, Daniel. Talk to you later. Now, you as a mom may not be real thrilled if your kid was off in a an incredible sensual, sexual environment after his own home had absolutely been destroyed, a prince of Israel, and now taken as a common slave, how's he going to do in that kind of environment? Well, Daniel does pretty good because he does resolve in his heart not to defile himself. We'll look at that, and that's one of the important things about the book. Second, the book emphasizes God's sovereignty and his authority over Gentile nations. God is not just interested in the affairs of Israel alone. It's God that raises up nations and brings them down. He predicts it. It goes off just the way that he said that it would. It's a book also the example of God's faithfulness to his covenant people and protecting and preserving them even though they were being disciplined. And we'll get that obviously in verse 1. Uh, the, the reason they're going into captivity is not as a reward. Uh, it's because of their absolute disobedience after men like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and others were begging them to repent and come back to, uh, to faith in, uh, in God and walk with the Lord once again. And they, they hardened their heart, they refused, and as a result, they went into this captivity. And even in that, even in the midst of their disobedience, God still had his hand on them and still preserved them and, and protected them. Uh, fourth Daniel reveals Israel's future deliverance, the blessings she will enjoy, enjoy in, the, uh, in the millennial kingdom. And, and that's uh, an interesting study just in and of itself. Uh, the book kind of outlines itself. Chapter 1, the personal history of Daniel. Uh, 2 to 7 is the prophetic history of the Gentiles. And then 8 to 12 is the prophetic history of, uh, of uh, Israel itself. And I've kind of summarized this uh, opening chapter in five points, but kind of built around verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself. Let's go ahead and read chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God, in Babylon and put the treasure, uh, put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Aspernerus, chief of the court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them uh, a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were entered the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, uh, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel, 
But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid uh, of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to, uh, to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with him, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus, which would have put him at about 85 or 86 or so by the time uh, Cyrus takes the, the throne. The, again, the, the focus in chapter 1 that we want to look at is, is the fact that <laughs> Daniel was able to go into this very sensual, very secular, very pagan uh, environment uh, as, a, as a young guy, probably 15 or, or 16. Uh, and uh, this is, again, at the besiege of his own city and being ripped away from his home. Uh, everything familiar to him, uh, it really couldn't get any worse. It's a Joseph kind of a story. And here's a guy that is able to stand for the Lord, to not compromise, uh, to not, you know, fall into uh, what uh, we all have to struggle with every day, and that is being conformed to this world. Again, Paul warns us to do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed from it by the renewing of your mind. And again, the J.B. Phillips translation says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold because it's an ongoing process. Uh, it's out there. It, it will happen to us. I want to read a little quote from a man named Ronald uh, Rawlheiser from an article he wrote called The Holy Longing. And he said this, uh, about uh, Christians in America. We want to be a saint, but we also want to feel every sensation experienced by sinners. We want to be innocent and pure, but we also want to experience and taste all of life. We want to serve the poor and have a simple lifestyle, but we also want all the comforts of the rich. We want to have the depth afforded by solitude, but we also don't want to miss anything. We want to pray, but we also want to watch television, read, talk to friends, and go out. It's a small wonder that life is often a trying enterprise and that we are often tried and pathologically overextended. There's a little bit of a conflict there in, in, in that quote. And uh, not to say that that goes on in uh, every one of our lives, but it probably does to some degree or another. So again, here's a great message if you're concerned about <laughs> sending your kids off to a, a secular institution of higher learning, are they going to be able to survive and, and have their faith intact? By the way, most don't. Most don't. Overwhelming percentage of Christian kids going to secular universities leave there four years later without their faith intact. Overwhelming majority. So how do they make it? But how do we make it? We live in a pretty secular world our, our, ourselves. Well, it becomes a very uh, interesting study for us. First, we'd say that uh, the obvious, Daniel is removed from the city that he loves, and we see that in the opening verses 1 and 2. Daniel records it's in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, and, uh, and as I said before, uh, the Jews themselves had, uh, this is Judah, the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom, Israel has already uh, gone into the uh, uh, Assyrian captivity, 722 B.C., uh, the final destruction of uh, Jerusalem is 586, but uh, this is a few years uh, earlier than that. Uh, they had refused to repent. What was their sins? They did not keep the Shabbat or the Sabbath. They didn't keep the sabbatical year every seven years. They were, <laughs> get the year off and not even supposed to work and trust God for his provision during that year. Give the land its rest and so forth. Uh, and they, they had turned to uh, idolatry. You know, that classic verse in Second Chronicles, if my people are called by my name will humble themselves and pray 
and turn from their wicked ways. Uh, and, and, the, and the humble themselves <laughs> and turn from their wicked ways. Well, the wicked ways was the sin of idolatry. And of course, then, then I will hear from heaven. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and basically he says, and I will forgive their sin. It's singular, and it's really the sin of idolatry. That's what sins them. And it's interesting, you know, God has a sense of humor. Uh, they're sinning in terms of uh, idolatry. Where does he send them to captivity? The mother of all places of, the birthplace of idolatry. That's where he, send, he sends them. It's like, you know, catching your, you know, 13-year-old smoking a cigarette, so you make him smoke a, cig- a whole cigar at one time. Yeah, it's, it's that kind of a deal. And, uh, and so he, he sends them into this captivity. Uh, the city is uh, destroyed by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. He attacks it uh, uh, in 605 uh, B.C. And, uh, and this is the occasion uh, of, uh, of Daniel being, being taken. Nebuchadnezzar goes back two other times. Uh, he leaves the city at this point in time, 605 B.C. He grabs some of the young men there. He takes the articles out of the treasure. Again, all of these details are exactly the way they're stated in the Babylonian Chronicles. Uh, he does that, but uh, he leaves immediately after a very short time because he hears his father has died, Neil, uh, Neil Palaser. And uh, he knows that uh, he's got the army, he's the rightful heir, but if he doesn't hot-foot it back there real quick and put a crown on his head, uh, you know, there's going to be some problems. Uh, He leaves in August, gets there in September, and the day he arrives, he's a crown to the new king. He takes over from his his father, uh, 605. Years go by, 604, 603. Remember, we're counting backwards. It's BC 2, 1, 98, 97. He goes back again uh, because uh, Jehoiachin, not to be confused with Jehoiachin, one is Korean, one is Chinese. <laughs> Kim, Jehoiachin, that's a very Korean name. Jehoiachin, that's very Chinese. So, You've got the last guy is Korean, the other guy's Chinese. That's how you tell the difference. Chin Kim. It's very confusing because they have the same first name. Uh, but he has to go back uh, again a second time because Jehoiachin is now reigning. And, and again, Jeremiah is there saying, listen, this is God's will. He's punishing you guys. Just kind of, you know, you know, trust God and roll with the punches here. You know, you guys are going into captivity. Settle down. You're going to be there 70 years and so forth. Just take it. You know, don't rebel against this. It's God that's brought Nebuchadnezzar here. But you know, listen to Jeremiah. So there's a rebellion. He goes back 597. Uh, this time, he takes 10,000 captive back with him to uh, Babylon, including the prophet Ezekiel. Uh, again, there's another rebellion, 588. He goes back. It's a long siege. And uh, two years later, 586, takes the city. At this point, he kills about everybody that he doesn't deport, burns the city to the ground, burns. This is the, the destruction that, Nebuch- that Nehemiah goes back to. That uh, it was so bad, remember, he couldn't even get by on horseback around the city. There was so much destruction. Walls are completely torn down. Uh, the temple is totally uh, burned to the ground and, and destroyed and so forth. So Daniel, by the time that happens, he's, he's been in Babylon for, uh, for a while. And as the text says, he remains there until the third year of, of Cyrus. Again, the temple being desecrated. That first time, the article's taken, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, we know from the Babylonian Chronicles that there were about 580 articles. I mean, they, they gave a, a list. Is there a little picture of that uh, for you? There it is. No, that doesn't mean a lot to you. These things kind of excite me, studying a little bit of archaeology. But uh, if you're ever in London, go to the British Museum, and you can see the verification of, of Daniel as being a tremendous historian and getting all of his facts uh, right. The temple was, uh, was desecrated. And, uh, and again, what they do is they took those articles and they took them and, and put them in the temple uh, there in Babylon to the, the god Bel, B-E-L, not Baal, but Bel, and, uh, and of course, his Messiah-type figure is, uh, is named Marduk, and that was the chief god of the, uh, uh, of the Babylons. And the idea of taking uh, treasure out of the temple of Jehovah and putting it in that temple was to say, our god defeated their god. And, uh, and that's the status of that. So uh, again, Daniel's removed from a city he, uh, he loves. And I want you to just keep that in mind, a 15-year-old kid that is uh, yanked out of his home, a prince of Israel. He's being treated like he's never been treated uh, in his life. 
uh, but at 15, he would already been bar mitzvah. He'd be a son of the law. He would know the word of God pretty thoroughly, even at uh, 15 years old. This kid would have been well educated in the things of the Lord. Doesn't mean he's going to walk with the Lord, and he's about ready to go under a huge test. I just say that it would have been very easy for him to be very bitter against God at what's happening, allowing this Gentile nation to come in, uh, go rampant over, over the city that he loves, rip the stuff out of the temple and all that. I have to believe that he understood the, the, the messages of Jeremiah, and they were getting what they deserved. And this, he just accepted it uh, and, then, and then went on. This is a lot about his character. The second thing we notice is uh, he's removed from the city and then he's required to, to serve the king. Uh, and the idea of uh, uh, serving the king here could have been, uh, it was a common practice. Uh, but what they did is they br bring these young guys in and they did everything they could to make sure that they became Babylonians. This is not an attempt to try to find some young Jewish guys that were real smart and were real good workers and will kind of utilize them. It was to bring them in and subjugate them to their culture, their lifestyle, their, their social habits, uh, their religion in every other way, to make them Babylonians. That's what uh, the process is going on here. So that they can then be heralded as an example to the rest of the captivities that this is what you need to do and this is what you need to be like while you're under my reign and under my rule. I mean, we can read this and go, wow, you're from the king's table, a hey, good education, hey, got a scholarship, doesn't sound too bad to me. No, that's not what's, what's going on here uh, at all. I mentioned Romans uh, 12, 2 before. Again, uh, we should not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. Uh, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. What happens when we become conformed to this world? People can't tell we're Christians. That's what happens. We, we, we lose uh, opportunities uh, for witnessing. We just, people can't tell the difference. Uh, that didn't happen to Daniel. Again, the king required specific qualifications, including without physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for learning, well-informed, quick to understand. And evidently, Daniel and his uh, friends met these qualifications. Uh, and then the first thing is the king required a change uh, in their education. Verse 4, he was to teach in the language and the literature uh, of the Babylonians. Why is he doing this? He wants to change the way they think. He wants to change the way they think. The way, their view before was of, of a God who created the heavens and the earth and spoke it into existence. But man was a sinner by nature because he had rebelled against God. And the only thing that God, man could do was cry out to God in mercy. And by his grace, uh, in following the, the law of God, he could have a relationship with them. And they want to wipe that out and say, that's not true. You have to change the way you think if you're going to get along in this culture. How do they do it? Through education, through submitting them to their languages, their thought processor, all of their literature, day and night, day and night, day and night for three years. That's all that they've, they've got. They wanted them to become Babylonians. You know, sometimes we send our kids off to liberal secular universities, and they're there for four years. They come back and they're liberal, liberal and secular, and we kind of wonder what happened. <laughs> they changed the way they thought because of the education they were getting every day. I don't know if you're aware. You should be aware. There are professors in universities, we know by experience right here in Hawaii, but across the mainland, that the only reason they're there teaching is so they can, they can if they have the opportunity, prevent young men and women 18, 19, to 20 years old uh, from believing in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. <laughs> teaching is a side issue with them. They, they, have, they have a bent. They're not just in the biology classes. They're in English classes. They're history classes. They're, they're all over. Not to say that there aren't some wonderful instructors in these schools. There are. But, um, but boy, if you're going to school, you can re relate to Daniel. Uh, here's the purpose, uh, again, to, to change the, the way that uh, they thought. Listen to what Paul says uh, in, uh, from Colossians, one of our studies of uh, uh, six or eight months ago, Colossians 2, 6. He says, so then... Just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. 
See that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Paul says there will be attempt by this world to take your thoughts captive, and they're going to do it through their their literature, through their teaching, through their music, through their educational systems, Paul says. And he says, hey, see to it that no, that doesn't happen to you. Rather, make sure you're rooted, you're grounded, you're built up. How you started in the faith, make sure you finish that way uh, in the faith. Uh, so incredibly important. Secondly, the king required a change in their diet. Why? He wanted to change their social customs. So he assigns a daily amount of food and wine to them. And of course, to these young, very kosher Jewish young men, they're not going to be able to eat this food. They're not going to be able to eat it because it's not kosher. It's not prepared in the right way. It, they can't eat certain things that are put on the table as well. Add to that the fact that it's already been all, all offered to a pagan god in sacrifice, which would have been the typical thing, uh, and then brought in before the king and those that ate at the king's uh, table. Uh, for them to eat this food would be to be, break the law, Exodus 34, uh, 15. Issues with drinking the, the wine as well, which would probably have been offered to pagan gods, and uh, the, uh, also the custom of the Jews, which was always to dilute their wine. Six parts of water to a part of wine, sometimes ten parts to one. Uh, and uh, this is what they refer to as, quote, strong drink that uh, the Babylonians had in Daniel it, we're, we're going to have to be required to drink this, eat this. What's the point? To change their, their social habits. Everything about their relationship with God uh, was, was tied to everyday life. And one of those things was eating. They only ate certain things. And the reason they only ate certain things is because they were God's covenant people. We're going to erase that. We're going to erase uh, your, your social habits, what you eat, how you eat, when you eat. Every, this is all an induction to make them Babylonian, changing their social customs. And then next, the king required a change in their names. Why? To change their religious conviction. Listen to the names uh, that these uh, young men have and tell you something of their parents. Daniel's name, of course, is, uh, means God is, is my judge. And, uh, and so they changed his name to uh, Belshazzar, which means Bel protect his life. Again, Bel, the, the head of the pathions of gods there in, in Babylon. We're going to now name you after him because he's the God that's now going to protect your life. And every time somebody says your name, you're going to be reminded of that. You're under Bel now. No longer will anyone be able to use the name of God around you again in your name, Daniel. The L is the, is the, uh, every one of these kids have got God, the name of God in their own names. Constant reminder to them that's going to be or meant to uh, erase that idea. Hananiah means uh, Jehovah is gracious. They changed his name to Shadrach. Rock is the sun deity. And so his name now means uh, illuminated by rock. And so every time they said his name, it's to remind them it's the sun god. That's who will bring you illumination. That's what will impress your, your heart and mind. Every time somebody says your name, you'll think of this. And then Mishael means uh, uh, who is what God is. It's very similar to Michael, who is like God. Mishael, beautiful name. Uh, who is what God is? No one. No one's like God. No one. But they change his name uh, to Meshach, which is... Um, uh, who is like Aku, Aku being one of, the, again, their, their pagan gods. And then Azariah, uh, Jehovah is my helper. He's changed to Abednego, the servant of Nego, again, another, another pagan god. Kind of doing a number on these kids, aren't they? I mean, they're, they're going to, to change their religious life. They're going to change their social customs. They're going to change the way that they think and make them purely uh, Babylonian. I remember when, um, when Kev, before he was Pastor Kev, and he was uh, going to the University of Hawaii as a, as a psychology major, he came to me at one point in time, and uh, so he kind of made the transition from uh, community college up to Manoa and just said, you know, I think I, I better come to see you once in a while and just kind of have some accountab accountability here. Man, I'm getting deluged with such secular ideas, such secular thought. The things that I'm going to have to 
memorize and, and put in my brain in order to get through college, man. It's unbelievable. If you've never studied any of the, quote, fathers of psychology, it's kind of an interesting one. I mean, the father of modern psychology and psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud. Here's a guy with a few problems. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've read a little bit about his life and everything. And, and this guy he had major problems, and yet he's the father, you know, of modern psychology. Carl Jung, he's the guy that develops uh, so much of uh, modern psychology. Well, he had spirit guides that showed him the truth of how the inner mind worked. Oh, good. Study that guy thoroughly, you know. And it goes uh, on and on. The realization that if I'm going to put these things in my mind, I better have some accountability to make sure I'm putting a lot more of God's Word in my mind as a little ballast here to keep me centered. And so we, we met off and on while Kev was uh, in school there. He was doing the Daniel thing. He was trying to make sure that he wouldn't be defiled because he had to do it to get a grade, to get their certificate so he could go on, and that's fine. You got to do what you got to do, but you got to realize what truth is, what error is, and how it can impact uh, your life. How much are you, re are you reading more of God's Word than secular literature? I mean, it, there's some great secular literature, history and so forth out there, and, uh, and that's great, but there's got to be a balance here if we're going to not defile ourselves. Social customs, again, can someone look at our lives and tell that we're, we're different because of our social customs, religious convictions, how we live our lives, how we make decisions? A lot to learn from this young man. Removed from the city he loves, required to serve the king. And, uh, and here's the important thing, Daniel resolved not to defile himself. Uh, the Babylonians could change his home, his textbooks, his menu, his name, but they couldn't change his his heart. He refused to be conformed to uh, their, their world. And there would have been all the reasons in the world to say, well, I'll just keep my religious convictions private, you know, because, you know, I'm in this environment. It's a little dangerous here. We could be, get killed saying doing the wrong. He didn't do that. I mean, he pretty much going into this thing resolved uh, that uh, I'm just going to take a stand for the Lord and let the chips fall, <laughs> basically. Um, he resolved or purposed in his heart not to defile himself. A couple of things about that that are important. Uh, one is it, it's a decision. Uh, it may have been influenced by his parents, but probably not. They were, they were long gone. They may have been killed. They may have been murdered uh, at this point. They certainly were not with him. Uh, it's a personal decision. And, uh, and I don't really think it mattered if his three friends did or not. Uh, I think it's just, he's just already decided uh, it's personal decision, and it's, uh, and it's a decision of commitment. And then secondly, very importantly, Daniel resolved to obey God's word. Look, look at verse 8. Daniel, uh, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official per, for permission not to defile himself in this way. What way? A way that was contrary or would force him to go against God's word. In other words, he goes into it and says, I'm just making a commitment I'm resolving in my heart, this is how I'm going to live no matter what. I'm not going to go against God's word. If it costs me everything, it costs me everything. If it costs me my life, it costs me my life. How do you get through uh, the world? How do you get through a, a secular university system? How do you get through it at work with your job and your career with your faith intact? You've got to make a personal commitment. It can't be because you're bolstered up by the friends around you or things seem to be going pretty well at home or with your boss or anything else. It's, got to, it's a personal commitment issue. And it's got to be, I'm committed to the Word of God. God's Word says this, I'm not going to break it. That would be more convenient. It's a little more tempting. It's not, it's not that bad. It's a small compromise. <laughs> you just decide that, that you're, you're not going there. Uh, that's, that's how Daniel did it. Let me read a little quote from D.A. Carson, an article he, uh, entitled Reflections. He says, people do not drift towards holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate towards godliness, prayer, obedience to the scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. We drift towards compromise and call it tolerance. We drift towards disobedience and call it freedom. We drift towards superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. <laughs> we slouch towards prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we've escaped legalism. We slide towards godlessness and convince ourselves we've been liberated. Guess what? You don't drift <laughs> towards a godly lifestyle. 
you know, you've heard of backsliding. There's no such thing as front sliding. <laughs> it doesn't happen. You got to resolve in your heart. This is what I'm going to do, no matter what. It can be done. Uh, this is incredible. Uh, Daniel's life and what he was able to do. But man, it took a lot of resolve. For Daniel made a request to prove God's faithfulness. We see that in verses 11 to 14. Requested to eat, eat only vegetables, drink only water for, for 10 days. And uh, the, the term there for vegetables may have included uh, grain products as well. It's kind of a broader term. But uh, again, uh, he's doing this so that he doesn't break the, the Mosaic law. Uh, that he eats no unclean thing. Uh, and, and of course, Daniel's request, we know that God gave favor to him with this chief official and said, okay, <laughs> might lose my head over this, but uh, we'll give it a shot. He doesn't say, let's give it like six months. You know, if you're going to try a new diet, would you like to say, here's a new diet and in 10 days you'll look like this. That sounds like a commercial, right? I mean, uh, but Dan in other words, if this happens, it'll be supernatural, right? I mean, if he eats vegetables and water for 10 days and he looks better than everybody else, of course, all the vegetarians, that's right. You know, it's healthier though. But uh, again, for him to alter his appearance in 10 days uh, based on this diet, it would be totally supernatural. Uh, this young guy's really stepping out in faith to uh, prove God's faithfulness. Uh, resolve not to defile himself, makes a request, and then lastly, Daniel supernaturally rewarded by God in verses 15 to 21. Uh, we find that Daniel received supernatural knowledge of, uh, from God, verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. Knowledge has to do with reasoning skills and thought processes. Daniel was able to think clearly and logically. Understanding has to do with insight, his ability to discern the nature of things, interpret them in their true light. And then he received a supernatural ability to understand vi visions and, and dreams, which obviously uh, would uh, end up placing him uh, in a position equal to prime minister eventually. Because we'll see in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar is going to have a dream. Uh, no one's going to be able to interpret it. And because no one is able to interpret it of his wise men and so forth, he's going to kill them all. Daniel's ability ends up saving their God-given ability, ends up saving their, their lives uh, and others, and placing him in a very prominent position in this kingdom that, as we'll see, leads to a very interesting relationship with the king eventually. Here's a guy that God humbles in a very unique way before it's all over with and Daniel's a guy that cares for him and gets him through it. So in the end, Nebuchadnezzar can say, Daniel's God, he is the most high God. And he kind of sees, sees the light. Daniel doesn't resolve, none of it happens. None of it happens. If he compromises right at the beginning, does God honor him? How can God honor him? How can God trust him? How could God elevate him to such a position? Uh, it all happens, again, rewarded by God because of his determined to uh, resolve himself to not defile, be defiled. He has uh, received a supernatural status uh, for serving the king. We see that in verse 20. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole uh, kingdom. So God uh, tremendously uh, elevates them. It's all based on Daniel's personal commitment not to be conformed to the pattern of the world. Uh, a commitment to to his life and that it was, uh, those decisions would be based on Scripture. Scripture says this, I'm going to do it that way. Scripture says don't do this, I'm not going to do that. It's real simple. <laughs> it's real simple. Again, Jesus said if you love me, then, then you'll obey me. John says the evidence of our salvation is our, uh, in First John, is our obedience uh, to, to the Lord. Uh, and we live in a in a frightful time in our country where, uh, generally speaking, based on surveys, it's very difficult to tell by social customs and so forth. It's very difficult to tell a Christian from a non-Christian uh, by the, the rate of divorce and marriage, by some of these kinds of, of statistics. It's very difficult to tell a Christian from a non-Christian. And um, as the old Sunday school song says, we need to dare to be a Daniel. <laughs> Uh, we're going to see some other keys in this young man's life. <laughs> the reason he goes, of course, into the lion's den is because he was a man of prayer. And even if the law said don't do it, he was, 
he was going to do it. So there's a lot for us to learn from Daniel and along the way then uh, the incredible prophecies that, uh, that he gives are uh, incredibly uh, exact in, in their detail and just uh, astounding in terms of the accuracy of, uh, of the Word of God. So I think it'll be a great study for us. As my rock, my strength, and my salvation. Shall not.